Welcome back to the channel, guys. I'm joined today yet again by GP Xavier. Welcome back. Thank you, Lucas. So I've been wanting to speak to you again for a while now, basically straight after our first conversation. And I'm happy to make it possible now. Uh, we have multiple topics that we wanted or could discuss, but we decided to start off with speaking about values. And I will link below a video you did on Max Scheler's hierarchy of values. Um, but yeah, I must admit, I haven't watched it thoroughly myself. So I'm going to uh, go into the darkness with you and hopefully you'll help me. And, um, and yeah, why don't you introduce a bit this topic and Max Scheler's uh, view on it? Okay, I'll see what I can do. So. Um, Max Scheler, he was a German philosopher of the early 20th century. Um, he's not particularly well-renowned -renow um, compared to like big names like Plato, Aristotle, Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. But I find him particularly fascinating. Um, he dealt a lot with values. Um, and he, his a particular approach to this was um, phenomenology, which is let's look at our experience and see what it's actually like. Let's kind of bracket any questions we might have about like its ontological status, like what this actually means behind the scenes. But let's actually just look really carefully and examine what is our experience like. And so he kind of applied this to, in particular, morality and value in general, um, which I think is a really helpful approach, um, partly because morality ethics can tend to be especially in the philosophical way of dealing with it, quite abstract. Yeah. So what I mean by that is we tend to reduce it to some kind of formalization, which might be utilitarian. For instance, the greatest happiness for the greatest number. That's a yeah. kind of calculation you can make. Um, or it could be more kind of Kantian, which is some you know something like the categorical imperative. Um some kind of thing which means that if my action is rational, if I could universalize it, if everyone could do the same thing that I'm doing and without contradiction, that means it's moral. So that's yeah. Kant's way of sort of reducing ethics to rationality. Mm. Um, and there's various other kind of approaches which I think kind of cut out what the actual experience of value is like. Um, because, for instance, the actual experience of value is a... It's not just reducible to say making some kind of calculation about how much happiness you're going to create for how many other people. It's sometimes that, it's partly that, um, but it's not the whole thing, nor is it some, some kind of rational thing where you're just saying, you know, does my action contain any inherent contradiction if I applied it to everyone? Yeah. Um, it's much more diverse and much more interesting than that. So I guess that's just a long way of saying that that's why I like Shaler's approach because he starts with the facts of experience mm. and he looks at the whole realm of value and says, well, what does it look like? And then he kind of um, describes it or maps it and what that map looks like. And this is kind of what he is famous for to the extent that he is famous is it there's a hierarchy of values. So there's a kind of structure inherent in our experience of value itself. Anyone can kind of introspect and find this structure where certain values are higher than other values. Um, and the way that he arranges it is very broadly speaking, is that the uh, sense, sensual values, there's different ways of kind of naming these different layers or levels, but um, at the bottom is sensual values to do with um, agree agreeableness, disagreeableness, pleasure, pain, that kind of thing. And then next, the next la layer up is uh, the vital or the noble values. So that's more to do with um, sort of vitality, excellence, courage, um, Nietzschean will to power as well. But above that is um, the spiritual values. Um, which could also be kind of seen as the intellectual values, if you're taking a less, um, like a more secular way of using language. The point being that these are where aesthetics is. This is where the appreciation of beauty is. 
this is where um this is where um like morality it, morality proper is um so this is where right and wrong values of right and wrong are found and then this is also um where what he calls the cognition of truth the value of the cognition of truth is found um he doesn't think that truth itself is a value um but that's a sort of technicality the the ex the cognition of truth the kind of experience of truth is a value so on the level of spiritual values you have beauty essentially you have beauty um uh truth and goodness the three transcendentals and then at the top you have the value of the holy which is an absolute value in the sense that it in the experience of it as you experience it it presents itself as absolute it presents itself as um, trumping all the other values that you might have. Um, and the classic example of this value, of course, would be God, the absolute being, something like that. The experience of it is sort of like absolute or overwhelming any other con considerations. Um, and so that's how he lays it out. And obviously he argues um, for why it has the structure and how it has the structure. Um, just a few kind of final comments about it. Um, so Shayla sort of recognizes that different people will have different um, kind of orientations towards values. Like some people may live uh, more for essential values or maybe others more for vital values. Uh, he also recognizes that... Um, it's possible for individuals and in whole cultures and periods of time and history to not be aware of certain values or not to be aware of certain um, sort of levels of value. Um, and this seems like a kind of argument for relativism. It's all relative, but he kind of clarifies that just because you're not aware of something doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And so... One example of this transformation that he cites is when Jesus comes and preaches um, the Sermon on the Mount. This is opening up a new realm of value, which the ancient world really didn't have the um, language for or the experience of. Um, but once it was opened up, it became available and it became... Um, much easier for people to um, grasp the ideas. It's not that Jesus created this. It's not that he invented it. He um, drew our awareness to it. And now in the modern world, of course, we kind of take it as being um, kind of intuitive or taken for granted, for instance, that kind of everyone is equal or we should love love you know others, even if they're not of our own culture or race, like these are just sort of like obvious values that for the ancient world were rather strange or perhaps not, <laughs> not even present. So yeah, that's kind of Shayla in a very small nutshell. That's excellent. I really like that. I'll, I'll bite right away at what you just said. So you're saying that the values that Jesus spoke about, they did exist before, but it's more of a uncovering of them or people making people aware of them is that what you're saying yeah so the the idea is that the what i guess let's take a step back what are values for shayla so values are just facts like they they're just facts about stuff that's there mm -hmm. um are their own they're their own category and so this is where other philosophies in his view and i'm pr pretty confident to say in my view this is where mm -hmm. other philosophies go wrong is they try and reduce um, value phenomena to other phenomena, right? Um, so like for Kant, he's in a sense trying to reduce phenomena of value to phenomena of rationality as though they're the same thing, but they're not. Um, and so, you know, another way to do it would be to sort of say that, um, you know, the world is a certain way or that we've evolved a certain way, therefore we should value in a certain way. Yeah. And that's sort of the whole is ought problem. Just because something is is this way doesn't mean that we ought to mm -hmm. do whatever. But the point that Shayla wants to make is that it doesn't really matter 
how the world is, and it doesn't really matter how logical rationality is. Values have their own structure. Uh, he he quotes a, a um, famous saying by Pascal, um, you know, the heart has its reasons that the head knows not, or something like that anyway. Um, basically, the heart has its own um, yeah. logical structure. And so that's what he's trying to map out. So to come back to your question, um, because values are just facts that are just there, every anyone can kind of tune into them if they have the right disposition or the right preparation or the right sort of openness or willingness. Um, that structure is always there in a sense. It's atemporal. It's not, it's not a temporally evolving structure. It just is in the way that mathematical facts just are. Yeah, like okay. They're not bounded by time. And so in that sense, what Jesus did is opened up a realm of values. He mm. didn't create them. He didn't invent them. Uh, he opened up our awareness to them. Yeah, that works. Okay. And and you're not uh, reducing values here either. Like what you're what you're doing in, in Taylor's approach is you're presenting them as facts. So they are. Yeah, they it are real in that sense. Facts, though, yeah. yeah, not facts in an empirical sense of well, kind of in an empirical sense, not facts in the sense of facts about nature or facts about the world, the physical world, not facts in that sense, but facts in the sense of like two plus two equals four or something. Yes. It's just like it just this is a fact about reality itself, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and I like the comparison with mathematics because that that makes a lot of sense to me. Exactly. Yeah. And so like mathematics is kind of intuitable to a certain extent, like um, the number two or two-ness, it, like it's irreducibly like it just is. You either know it or you don't have any conception of it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And yeah, so absolutely. that's Shayla's approach to value. If yeah. if you were for some somehow a being that didn't have any sense of value, um you wouldn't be able to explain it to that being like similarly, like the color blue is also like an irreducible reality. Like if you don't have the capacity to see or to see color, there's no way that you can um, experience or even comprehend the color blue. The moment you see it, you understand it fully in a sense. And so this is similarly the case with values. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of the number zero because it was not a number that was used in um, at least parts of antiquity. Mm -hmm. So the Egyptians didn't even understand the number zero. To us, number zero is obvious and it, it helps us tremendously um, mm. with so many things. But um, that was like a, a revolution discovering the number zero. And so yeah. I think similarly with some of those values that you've spoken about. Yeah. Um, I think I will put up, um, yeah, I think I just want to edit it just to put up the, the pyramid you have of the value and the hierarchy of values. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering when I'm looking at the period pyramid, is it then, is it the same for, is this framework the same for everyone? And then do they have different specifics within the absolute, the spiritual, the vital and the sensual, or can it act, actually be bottom up or top down for, for other people? Yeah, so I guess the first thing to say would be this is like a very broad general schematic. So within each of those levels is like many, many values, many, many specific values which have a specific shade of meaning. Um, yeah. So like, for instance, within like, um, you know, like right versus wrong, there's all these very fine shades of um like rightness or moral words that you could use, you know, like, I don't know, like kindness, brutality, like, you know, all these specific things. So that's the first thing is that it's, it's much more varied than that. Um, but these are sort of the broad level um, schemes. Mm. Um, the second thing is that, well, is it the same for all people? Well, Yes and no. So it is the same, at least in potential for all people, because everyone can access this. And if they really in, in, introspected in a thorough and honest way, and they had the capacity to kind of 
access these realms of value, they would come to the same conclusions. That's Shayla's argument. Um, I think it's a reasonably good argument, but mm. there's other arguments that suggest that morality is more um, relative. But there are realms of value that, for instance, I don't really understand. Like, I mean, um, the holy. I haven't had much experience of the holy. Um, but someone who's had like a vision of God, for instance, yeah. would have had a very immediate sense of what that actually means. Um, so for me as an individual, I'm kind of limited in that sense because I haven't had much of a direct intuition of that. Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Yeah. And then in terms of like which way the pyramid is oriented, um, so this is this is kind of a separate topic, but also a very interesting one. Shayla also wrote a book, um, a short book called Resentiment, which is um, sort of a Nietzschean term. It's the French word for resentment. Um, so this is basically the the sense um, the sense of that word in the sense that um, Jordan Peterson uses it. Um, so for Nietzsche, resentment motivates like ideology, specifically ideologies that try to equalize everyone. Um, so Shayla wrote a book about this and for him, resentment kind of is the turning upside down of the hierarchy. <laughs> mm. Um, and so it's possible in a sense, it doesn't mean that it's possible in the sense that you can willfully deceive yourself for ulterior motives. That would be the way that I would put it, right? Yeah. So if you know, for instance, that you cannot achieve a certain level of value and you become resentful because of that, instead of just accepting that and coming to terms with that and trying your best, what you might want to do is either say there's no objective um, hierarchy of value or you may even want to turn that um, hierarchy on its head. So you would devalue all that is higher um, hmm. than your level and you would, um, you know, value what is lower. The last thing I'll say on that note also is that Shayla kind of sees modernity as being um, motivated by or kind of, in, what's the word, like possessed by resentment. So Basically, you know, he argues that from the French Revolution onward um, through the Enlightenment, a lot of this is being motivated by resentment. And mm. so um, in a way, the world we have today has inverted the pyramid, um, the hierarchy. And there's on, on that hierarchy um, on the screen there, is actually sort of a lower level than sensual values, but it's a kind of pseudo level. Yep. Um, so it's it's the level of utility. <sighs> and the reason that it's not on the pyramid is because it's not like it's not like a real value. It's just like utility is for the sake of something else, if you know what I mean. So it's yep. a kind of pseudo value. Yeah. And so Shayla argues that the sensual values for pleasure and pleasure basically and utility have come to dominate society and basically are the motivating highest values for society. Um, and that that's a result of resentment. I think that's a very good argument. I don't know if I would agree with it fully, but I think that is a very good argument. I think mm. we've lost a sense of reverence for the spiritual values. Obviously it goes without saying for the holy and also a lot of the time for the noble, the vital, and those kind of things as well. So when we're talking about turning it upside down and mm -hmm. that we are dominated in a sense by the, the lower values or even lower than the lower, so the instrumental, mm -hmm. um, are we then implying that this hierarchy of values is in some way realer than that or truer than that? So, yes, basically. Yeah, right? So we, we can't really change the structure of values. That would be Shayla's argument. Yeah. We can only deceive ourselves and each other about that structure. One thing that I'm, I'm curious by is that 
on the absolute values and you can see the screen right i'm sharing it yes yeah okay so i don't have to edit it that saves me a world of time but um it says holy and un and unholy so what what could the unholy be as an absolute value right yeah um and that's that's so values for Shayla and I think for us as well, but values are kind of like neutral, like a neutral term. So I guess technically the unholy is a disvalue, but it's a type of it's a type of value, right? It, it's a it's 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 a phenomenon of value. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so holy versus unholy. I mean, what would what would an example of the unholy be? probably the devil like <laughs> evil as a metaphysical entity you know what i mean like uh, that would be the unholy so you could have a, a vision of god you could have a experience of enlightenment or of um, a vision of god of merging with god those would all be examples of uh, encountering the holy um, but you could also potentially and i think a lot of people have uh, have a encounter with like the essence of evil and have an encounter with like the devil or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's really curious to me because if we've inverted in the modern times, the, the pyramid in some sense, you could understand that as doing something unholy or it seems like an unholy society or some sense, but you can also have the pyramid be exactly the same, but just have, I mean, Satan on top. <laughs> so what is there, is there, there is a difference between the two. Yes. Yes. So it's about like, I guess it's about like the level. So there's, there's positive versus negative valence, right? So that's holy versus unholy, right versus wrong, beautiful versus ugly. And then there's the level that they're on. One way to kind of maybe think about this is that what, what exactly is evil? What exactly is like the unholy versus the holy? I'll just stick with those terms. Mm -hmm. If you are incapable of uh, encountering, understanding, or exhibiting those values of holy or unholy. Can you can you even do anything on that level? Um, so, for instance, if you're just purely motivated by sensual pleasure and utility, like you can't really see beyond that. Yes, I see. You might do bad things, right? But you never do anything truly abhorrently abominable yeah. do you know what i mean like yeah. yeah this is like you know um this the story peterson tells sometimes of like um the nazis got um the the um concentration camp inmates to sh simply shift um rocks from one end of the camp to the other and back again there's no utility in that there's no sensual pleasure in that there's no, like, that's an example of just sheer evil malice. You know what I mean? Um, someone who's just trying to, you know, <laughs> just live a hedonistic life doesn't indulge in those kind of things. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, so so I think I really understand it. And then someone who has Satan at the top. I mean, I think I was watching, um, have you seen Amadeus about Mozart, that movie? I haven't, but um, is it good? I kind of want to watch it. I think it's very good. I watched it a year ago, and I thought it was a modern movie, but I think it's from the 80s. And I find it to be really fascinating. And, uh, well, the main character, I think, is Mo uh, Mozart, Moses. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the, the person who's telling the whole story is his great rival of some sorts. So he's basically telling the story of how Mozart came into his life and how terribly he hated him. And um, mm -hmm. it's funny because he describes his experience with um, God as a child where he remembers being in church or maybe he was just at the dinner table, but he went to church all the time and he would ask God to become a musical um, talent, to, to become a composer, mm -hmm. I guess, to really reach the highest levels of that. And he says, I will give you everything. I will give you everything for that. And, um, then his father dies and he sees that as a miracle um, because he didn't like his father. And I think his father wanted him to do to pursue another path. Yeah. And then um, 
he keeps having this weird relationship with God where he's like, well, I've, I promise to do this. You give me this wealth or you give me this, uh, this power, let's say. Mm. And mm -hmm. I think that's some sort of lower force, but it does seem to, to work for him. And he does seem to get enough um, out of that to, mm. to believe that it's, that it's a higher force, but I think it might be a, a satan, satanic drive of some sorts. And so, yeah, yeah, that, that that's that's kind of how I'm understanding it a little bit. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think that basically, let's call it like the principle of evil. Well, this is straying a little bit outside of Shayla, but um, the principle of evil kind of um, feeds on, it does feed on the lower motives, right? So you can start off as just being simply a kind of egoist or a hedonist and being in that sense quite harmless because you know, it's easy to deal with hedonists as you just give them what they want, right? Yeah. Um, but the fact is that if you go further down that path, right, then um, there's a way that I think, let's call it, for a want of a better term, the principle of evil or the force of evil can come in and then you end up doing things that are above and beyond just what would satisfy you in the moment. So I think I think again, the the whole language around resentment is actually a really good way um, to to describe this. I think this is part of Nietzsche's genius, and Shayla incorporates um, incorporates that insight, and Peterson kind of popularized it today. But that yeah. just that idea of that I'm not getting what I want. I want more, more, more. Existence itself must be at fault, right? I'm going to make it worse, not only for myself, but for everyone around me, right? And then when you go down that path, you're, you're not being egoistic. You're not being hedonistic. You're making it worse. Why? Like it's irrational in, in a pure utilitarian sense. I would say that's where the kind of the spirit of evil comes in and, um, that's why you're doing these things is because you're kind of beholden to the unholy or you're beholden to evil in a way. Right. Yeah. Um, if that makes sense. It does make sense. How would I know if I'm not beholden to evil? Like, is there a, a clear way to distinguish that? Because I think a lot of people think they might be serving God and they're serving the devil. Well, that's a really good question. And I think one thing that comes up for me when I'm thinking about the holy is um, let's say certain problematic um, passages from the Bible. So yeah. the, the less problematic, more interesting one is Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, right? Now, to me, the relationship between the biblical God and Abraham is clearly one where Abraham takes the biblical God to be um, holy, like the experiences that he has, the encounters that he has, and the fact that he simply obeys him regardless of the consequences. And I think that the sacrifice of Isaac or the near sacrifice of Isaac is the ultimate example of that. Because if you experience the absolute, like, what are you going to do? Are you going to morally quibble with it? Like it's the thing that overwhelms all other yeah. considerations, right? Now, if you are on the side of the biblical God and you want to argue for him, what you would say is that, and in this case, you know, Abraham trust. He knew that he was good. He trusted his goodness. He didn't question. He was obedient, and everything worked out well. So you know that's okay. Um, but it is ambiguous, and I think the more problematic example, which also is very much to do with the phenomenology of holiness, is in the Israelite um, conquest of Canaan, mm. where they are ordered to sacrifice all living creatures they come across, including humans to God. That is classic example of the phenomenology of the holy. Um, you know, this just um, sacrifice. Um, it's a specific term, I think, uh, harem or harem or something like that, which basically means everything is set aside um, for God. It's not so much to do with the destruction or the killing aspect, but it's more to do with like the God has ordered this. Um, this is all set aside for him. Um, yeah. so modern people have a lot of trouble with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I don't know exactly what to make of it and I'm not exactly trying to kind of do apologetics. Um, yeah. but 
I think that's a really good, like, it's a really good uh, question. How do you know um, the holy and the unholy both appear to you as overwhelming all other considerations? I'll put it, I'll just say that. Yeah, no, that absolutely. And I think there, there's no obvious way to distinguish the two. So I don't know how, how to do it for myself. I, I, I think that what you can do is try to um, get feedback from people around you and to to always pray for for the virtues that you know are good because i do think you can know that humility is good that you can know that gratitude is good and i think once you really start straying from the path it becomes very obvious but i think that the, the tricky thing with yeah the devil and i think that might put people off but you know evil is that it can sometimes be so extremely similar like there's a there's a show i think it might be in the us as well i don't know about uh, australia or new zealand but in the netherlands it's been very popular where it's this game show and there's this group of i don't know usually it's famous people from the country and they go to a different country and you have to do these these tasks basically as a group you have to do these group problems mm -hmm. and it can be whatever, like it can be around the city or it can be in nature where they just have to solve these things. And um, yeah, or it can be a physical task or it could be more of a mind thing. And anyway, there's one person in the group who's always sabotaging and he's, he's been, he or she has been picked out before the game starts to sabotage the game. And then at the end of every episode, everyone has to guess with the number who they think is most likely to be the, the person sabotaging the thing. And and what's fun about this show is that it will take most people the entire show um, and then they reveal to actually figure out who is sabotaging the game because it's mm -hmm. it's it's so not obvious that <laughs> whoever is 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 basically destroying um, what everything That's... what everyone is working out and it's it's similar to psychopaths you know it's like they can yeah. seem super genuine in what they do and I think to extrapolate that. Um, I think a similar thing can be true with the devil and God to use, to use that language. Um, it can be super, super similar. Go ahead. I was just going to say that show as an aside, that show sounds really Girardian in a way, because it implies <laughs> that there's always someone sabotaging. If we could just find the one person that's yes. sabotaging, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's got this you hidden sacrifice message. Them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's funny. And then you see that they do the false uh, scapegoat all the time because they, mm, mm. but the person that that's, that's the thing that the person who gets sent off is the one who has the most incorrect answer. So I guess it's not a, mm. it's not a voting off of, <laughs> of the, of the yeah. actual. Secretary, Whereas yeah. it, it's funny because I grew up with this show and then another show that we grew up watching as a family. And the other show is exactly that where they go to remote, remote Island. Mm -hmm. And it's also, they're working out, um, they're doing these these challenges and it's teams against teams, but mm -hmm. every team sends home a person. This, let's say the mm -hmm. losing team. Oh, that's so funny actually. The losing team sets, sends home a person after the end of the, I don't know, the challenges or whatever. So they sacrifice someone. <laughs> and then yeah, yeah. The group coheres once more. Oh, that's yeah. Funny. I mean, um, but to come back to the question of like the similarity of God and the devil um, in a certain sense. Um, I mean, I, I'd... I think that is a real problem. I mean, what that I the, the key point is that the holy is above the level of right and wrong, yeah. right? And so, at least according to this scheme, but this kind of fits with Kierkegaard's idea as well, right? Which is that um, you've got the level of the aesthetic first, and then you've got the level of the ethical, yeah. and then eventually you may get to the level of the religious, and the level of the religious is above the ethical. And of course, he made a big thing about Abraham's sacrifice of his son being, or near sacrifice, I should say, but that his willingness to sacrifice his son was him transcending the merely ethical, because on the ethical level, that is wrong. Like, like we don't need to do mental gymnastics in order to try and make it right. On the level of morality, it was wrong. What justified it was that God ordered it. That that would be consistent with the hierarchy, I think, yeah. is that the holy does trump um, the level of morality. And 
you know, I'm not 100 percent sure what I feel about that. I think that yeah, goes against dangerous. your intuitions. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes. Um, it's also potentially dangerous because it allows justifications of things that may genuinely be bad or that may be even generated by Satan or whatever. That's a good um, question. That does yeah. actually the is is the yeah what you call it the over overriding of of the holy or the unholy well let's say the holy is it justified when it's clearly wrong because it, i mean in the, in the abraham mm -hmm. story it, it clearly is but like i i would read that for example and what if you had sacrificed the son i mean of course he didn't so you can't really talk about it but like yes but what if what you if had, he had is is it god then or, or yeah i don't know i think from the i think from the perspective of the people who are writing this text and kind of developing this text, I think, yes, I think the answer is yes. It was, it was maybe right is the wrong word because it's kind of begging the question, was it moral or not? But was it valuable? Was it more valuable than doing the merely right Yeah, in that thing? sense, for sure. I think, yeah, absolutely it was. Um, but I think the problem comes in when we, because I think the same thing can be applied to the conquest of Canaan. Like, I think those acts were clearly viewed as being um, the most valuable thing because the absolute being ordered it. Um, and so in a way, I'm I'll, instead of just saying the obvious thing, which is that these things are morally problematic, I'll try and steel man them a little bit. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> or at least I'll try and steel man the sense that the holy is higher than the moral. Yes, Existence itself is not moral. Now, <laughs> a Christian might have a problem with that because <laughs> God himself ultimately is moral, right? Or at least something like that. Um, but to all appearances, existence, reality is fundamentally morally ambivalent. Um, I think that the closest a secular person can get to a experience of the holy, and this includes myself, is kind of contemplating just the mere fact of existence itself. The fact that anything is, the, the universe maybe, thinking about the size of the universe, the vastness of it, the yeah. power and energy of it, the fact that it's expanding at this incredibly fast rate. Like these, these are things I think that get us close to the sense of the holy. But what they get us close to isn't a moral reality. It's a it's a trans moral reality or an amoral reality. It's, it's the, just the vastness and overwhelmingness of being itself. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm just thinking out loud here, this isn't what Shayla argues, but mm -hmm. um, you could say that if you can have that, if you have that experience and you, and your fundamental reaction to it is yes, this being existence with all its, um, issues and complexities is good, is fundamentally good. I affirm it. I want it. I choose it. Then I think that's maybe close to an experience of the holy. Mm. And if you can have that experience and your reaction is something like, this is, this is bad. Nothing should ever have been. I should never have been born. I reject it. Maybe that's something like the experience of the unholy. Yeah. Because it is some sort of a higher a higher force that you're experiencing when you have that conviction at least. And it's the same with the goodness. I think that well when I when I feel it, when I feel it in my bones that it's good and that mm. it's that it's worth living, that's almost mm -hmm. a religious experience. Like when I really meditate on it, um mm -hmm. it, yeah, it lifts me up. Like it, it feels transcendental. But I can I can imagine yes. that the opposite holds true as well. Like when you're talking about school shooters, for example. Oh, absolutely. They are absolutely beholden to something. Why would you? Yeah, do I mean, it's it's tough. I mean, um, you know, the, the human mind can go to so many different places. So you, you can have moments of sort of transcendent joy um, where you feel like you can affirm all of being. And then you can have moments where you've got maybe a lot of suffering in your life where you feel like being is just a horrible mistake. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. that that is um 
kind of part of being human. I guess the question is, what do you do with that? I have, I have one more question about also the the values and the holy specifically. So mm -hmm. we, we keep talking about the experience of the holy. And um, I think a lot of people don't have that, mm. but they still want to, they, like, for example, people propositionally appreciate God, especially mm -hmm. nowadays. Like there's a big, big movement of uh, like modern um, conservatives that maybe grew up atheists, but they were really like, oh, I really understand this God thing and I can see how it helps mm -hmm. people. Um, but they don't have that experience. Is, is, is there a way in which you can still, yeah, so not experience it, but still have that hierarchy there, even though you've, 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 like, you've got no experience possibly of it. You have some conception of it, but it's really far from you. Um, yeah, what would you say to that? I mean, that's a really good question. And that's a question that I'm thinking about too, because I don't know to what extent that I've had an experience of the holy. I guess yeah. it depends what you were willing to include as the holy. What, what I could be doing is just including some spiritual um, values as the holy. For instance, when I'm talking about the scale of the universe or it's, it's, it's just sense of just being there, maybe that's just some kind of aesthetic contemplation. Maybe that's the cognition of truth that I'm talking about. Um, what actually is the holy? Um, I would probably tend towards the more cautious side of things and say that the holy is... That which is in that which is embedded in religious experience, like visions of God, experiences of enlightenment, oneness, um, those kind of things. Um, yeah. uh, that that would be my kind of safe answer because I think that we have a tendency nowadays to sort of think that, and this is part of what I was talking about before. Like everyone should have access to all the values, um, but. It may just be that that's not the way things are. Yeah. So it may be that people can go through their whole lives without having a sense of the holy or an encounter with the holy or only a vague and background sense. Um, and maybe that's just the way things are. But can they then still access the same hierarchy of values? Can they still have the holy as, a, as an absolute value? I think so. I think that you can I think that you can intuit the presence of values that you haven't had a full immediate experience of. Yeah. Um, because how to talk about this? I guess it's in the definition of the holy that it has a certain relationship with other values. Um yes. it's absolute. That yes. would be part of the definition, right? Um, yeah, yeah, of course. If it wasn't, we'd be talking about something else. We wouldn't yeah. be talking about the holy. And hmm. are, is the, are these values objective to you? Uh, um, so how do you mean? Maybe expand the question a little bit. Well, I'll, I'll go into my own, um, my own mind a bit because I've thought about morality and a value is less mm -hmm. so, but now I think it's, I think it's connecting to it a lot. So I'll give the example of morality. It's just a question I've thought through so much. I I know that morality, well, I really believe that morality is not fully subjective. Mm -hmm. And that notion bothers me. Like I've had I've had heated arguments with just friends in the gym about this. Yeah. Where it would just be about the subjectivity of morality and, and there's just examples there, there's logical conclusions you can take that that are really evil in my view but i think mm -hmm. that's caused me to want to swing to the other side and be like no they have to be absolutely objective mm -hmm. um, and i think now i'm at a stage where i'm no longer trying to prove whether they're objective or subjective or something whole else because i'm not looking to be right i'm looking for the truth yeah. i think the truth is a little bit more complex than that and so yeah. similar with the question of values um I don't think they're subjective fully. I think they're similar to numbers. Um, I think morality works in a similar way. Mm. Um, and it's it's difficult because I think if you don't have the connection to the holy, it's not as obvious with the values, for example, what the hierarchy is even like, um, unless someone I, teaches you. Yeah, I find it very interesting that we've been sort of hanging out on the top of the hierarchy, talking about the holy, yeah. um, when in a way that's the most mysterious part of the Absolutely. hierarchy. <laughs> yeah, that's um, why it, that's why it pulls me though. 
yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Because it's so mysterious. And, and you're right, I guess, in a certain way of looking at it, you could say it grounds the hierarchy because it is the absolute. So yeah, it, it would be very strange if things sort of topped out at sort of the spiritual values or something like that, and you felt like there was this missing missing level. Yeah. Um, what I will say in response to, to your question is that uh, for Shayla, values aren't laws. That is to say that they're not specific. Like you you have a country and it has specific laws and they're, they're highly specific like they're written out that they they deal with you know specific types of situations that could happen they're very clear or as clear as they can be um, but then you have the principles upon which those laws were written so values are more i would say the principles upon which the laws are written um, you're not going to look into the realm of value and find many clear things like even something as seemingly simple as do not kill right has clearly got many um qualifications there are times yeah. when it may be justified to kill or even necessary to kill um so so it's more about the principles underlying underlying things and this is where subjectivity comes in because that needs to be translated into action um, and and therefore, it needs to be usually translated into laws if you're talking about a, a community of people following the same principles. And it needs to be um, translated into kind of judgments that individual people make um, based on all their experiences. Um, and so you're going to see variation. You're going to see variation for specific people and specific places. One interesting point that Shayla makes is that Often laws are actually written to you can't judge a you can't judge a, a people by their laws necessarily by saying that oh, okay they have all these laws around this thing so that must mean they must display this virtue really strongly it, it it can be the case that the laws are written to protect them from something that they are particularly susceptible to you know yeah. what I mean yeah yeah um, so I can't remember if um, he brings up this example but um, one example that comes to mind is that Spartans, right? We think of Spartans as being like very um, self-disciplined and having this um, very um, sort of military attitude to life, um, despising wealth and, and so on. But actually what the ancient writers write about them is that they they had this avaricious streak that would come out and every now and again. And mm. there's examples of some of their leaders being like absolutely corrupt and just hoarding gold. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's you could argue that the laws were kind of built to um, protect them from something that they were particularly susceptible to. Mm -hmm. um, that's a bit of a tangent. I just thought it was interesting. <laughs> the, point, interesting. the point is that the laws do not mean that the laws are not the values, I guess. Yes. Okay. That I got. And and the laws are, I think, more, we have more power over laws than, than the values, of course. And so. Yeah. Yeah. And and the individual instantiations of the principles will also always vary. Um, yes. As well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then individual instantiations are what what cause a lot of people to consider the subjectivity of values, morality. Yeah. Let's say, um, like they'll use arguments exactly. like this is different there, so it's pretty much ambiguous. Or, but but we're saying that it's not. Well, that's certainly what Shale is saying. I, I, I'm very uh, cautious to make absolute statements on things, I think. Um, I can wise. see the arguments for it. One thing I'm pretty confident about is this. We can't talk meaningfully um, about human affairs without using um, value-laden language. It's just impossible. Like, it's mm. just not, you can't even begin to have a discussion. Um, and so, in that sense, it's just necessary like there's just these basic phenomena that are just necessary um to talk about uh, because like even if you try and be a relativist your your language is shot through with value anyway like yeah. you, you know every every word is is tinged with value and, and and derives its meaning from value and secondly you're also actually existing in um within certain values as well, like the classic example, I don't know if this is classic or not, but the common example would be, you know, someone arguing for complete relativism, 
but they have like a strongly, strongly held set of values that they believe everyone should follow that centers on diversity and so yeah. on and so forth, right? Like yeah. they have their value structure and they believe that it's objective, but they're also making this argument of complete relativism. Yeah. It's a performative contradiction. Yeah, especially when we're talking about human rights or, you know, these these things that are not obviously universal. Exactly. Precisely. But we treat them as yeah. such. Mm -hmm. Okay, where did I want to go from here? Um, <laughs> I, I just had a thought. I just completely lost it, I think. Um, holy on holy, right and wrong, subject. Oh, yeah, quality. No, mm. values. Yeah, we're talking about value. And it, it reminded me of quality because I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Persick's work. Um, he wrote... I read, um, read Sin in the Motorcycle. Yes. Motorcycle. Sin in the Art of Motorcycle. Time. And yeah. he, he also wrote Leela. Mm, I haven't read that one yet. But... I quite like it, actually. I, I read that first, but it's a sequel to it. So it's kind oh, of stupid. Okay. Too. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's much less popular. But it, it goes yes. deeply into this, into this question of... Um, quality and he conceptualizes the metaphysics of quality mm -hmm. where the, the whole thing about these books is that i think what he figured out is that we cannot really understand the whole world through a subject object lens like it seems to be extremely limited that view mm -hmm. and it seems to not apply to a lot of situations mm -hmm. and so our whole discussion and a lot of the questions that pop into my mind about the reality of, of these values are framed within that framework. And so mm -hmm. I think I might be reducing things when I'm just using that language. Um, subject, object, Aristotelian metaphysics, they're a specific type of, of map that we can use to understand certain things. And it's extremely useful. But mm -hmm. I think when it comes to to values or to morality, do we need something else? And and Piercy conceptualizes the metaphysics of of quality, mm -hmm. um, where you have dynamic and static quality, for example. And 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 I think with that framework, you can understand a lot of things about reality. I don't know if everything, but mm. and I don't know if that's the right framework to use here. But I'm I'm, I'm looking for another way to understand it, and I'm not sure how to. Um, and with with quality, because it's been a long time since I've read the books, <laughs> but would I be would I be right in saying that quality is basically it's basically a value based term? Like it's I, not like it's 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 how would you describe quality? How would you define it? Well, that's the funny thing. It's a part of the book where it's like try to describe quality. I really think that's mm. like I, I think that's like a part of the book. But people can correct me if I'm wrong. But there, there, there will be a, I think he's a teacher at some point, the main character in a school. And he asks the kids to, to write about quality. What is it exactly? And he figures mm -hmm. out that no one is able to do that. Um, so <laughs> that's, I think that's part of the reason why he centers his, his work around that is because it's not reducible or, or mm. you cannot really, yeah, you cannot really grasp it as much. C could you describe it as that which orients you? Is that the sense that he's talking about it? You're, you're seeking something in whatever you do, right? That yes. that orients you and directs you. I I think it might be. It's an it's an attractive idea to me, but I'm I'm not sure because same with me. I think I haven't touched it in a bit. These ideas mm. and they're not as they're not as um, integrated with me. But I'd love. I've been trying to talk actually to Sevilla King, who. Well, I don't know if she's a specialist on on Robert Persick's work, but her whole. Her whole YouTube channel and all of her work is centered around, um, so centered around that. So it's called a quality existence. So I would yes, actually yes. be excited to to speak more about that. Yeah, her. maybe I should talk to her too. I've come yeah. across the channel. I haven't watched too much of it, but um, but it does yeah. look very interesting. Um, uh, on let, the let, note of quality, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I I'm willing to run with that. So, so let's say we we assume that that that's what quality is. Yeah. Um, how, how would that tie into this discussion? Yeah, so the link I was seeing is just that, you know, existence is um, irreducibly value-laden. That's kind of the point that I was getting to. It's 
it's not, uh, you know, I think that Viveki's essentially made this point in different ways a lot as well. Like you can't just take value out of the equation and and it's, it's as though you're like left with the physical world or something like that as the remainder. And you can just look at the physical world and look at facts. It's like value is just part of being. Um, if you're doing science, you're using value to guide you. You're yeah. using value to see through. Like if you take away value from the experience of being, you take away being like you won't be left with anything. Um, it's kind of hard to express in words what I'm getting at, but mm. I think think you get what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Like everything we do is value based. Yeah, and, I really understand it. Yeah, absolutely everything. So there's a unity between value and being um, at the at the fundamental level, at least as far as we're concerned, right? Yeah, there's no way to separate them. No, absolutely. I mean, you need some something to to drive you and to aspire to. And I think even, that, that's what yesterday I had a conversation with someone and we were talking about the spiritual and um, about people that, that say that they're not spiritual at all or that they're not religious for that matter. Yes. And of course, there's there's trouble with what, what you mean by religious and this and that. And of course, in some conception, I, I wouldn't want to call myself that. But in another way, I really would. And I, I, yes. I thank for Vakey for that. But it's this idea that everyone is driven by spirits of some sorts. Yes. Everyone. Um, yes. Just because you won't acknowledge them doesn't mean that they're not running your life. And so the similar thing holds true for value, I think. Or maybe yeah. it's a different conception of it, but yeah. In the deep sense of those terms, yes, everyone is spiritual and everyone is religious. There's no way to opt out of those phenomena, right? Yeah. Um, of course, there's also a useful, like, less deep way to use those terms, um, which I'm not trying to deny. <laughs> um, you know, when someone says I'm not religious, I understand what they mean. Yeah. But in a deep sense, no, like, no, like, those are part <laughs> of our, those are part of experience itself. Like, you believe that you're this kind of, um, self that exists and persists through time and has this kind of like integrity, has all these rights. Um, you know, you believe other selves just like you exist that have their own experiences, their own rights, their own, like all of that is religious. Like yeah. it's fully like mystical. It's, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, none like of that is drivable from science. Exactly. If there's no logical way to, to, to mm. conclude that this is real, then, then you, you're believing in something. And I don't know what exactly. it is, but <laughs> it's there. For exactly, sure. exactly. Yeah. And, okay. And so likewise with values, right? So if you yeah. say I have no values, it was like, well, that you you wouldn't be alive if that. Yeah. <laughs> what are your values? Are you you know you just you just have nihilistic values, like you just don't care about things, or you like actively want people to suffer or yeah or maybe you're just or maybe you're not that bad maybe you're just a hedonist and you're living for momentary pleasure that's okay too but you know mm -hmm. like you have values you're motivated you 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 live and you act so yeah yeah so let's do something we haven't done yet is go go down a bit into the the spiritual values or perhaps the vital values i'm not okay, sure if cool. i've understood fully the vital values so when we're talking about the noble for example mm. how does that manifest itself this is really interesting, and this is one of the one of my favorite things about Shayla. He tries to integrate. This is this is something I'm hopefully going to make some future videos on. Shayla mm. really wrestles with and tries to integrate Nietzsche and Christianity together, and in this this hierarchy, partly I would say is an expression of that, um, because the vital values I would say are things that were held as being. Um, valuable by the ancient world, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks and Romans, um, certainly through the medieval period and, and things like night, you know, the culture of knights and so forth. Yep. Um, and also found expression in Nietzsche's work as the will to power. Um, and so the idea is basically that life wants to expand, life wants to um what does it want to do? It wants to expand. It wants to overcome itself. It wants to test itself. It wants to, you know, develop itself. It mm. wants to be the best specimen of its type as it possibly can be. So this is the Greek worship of the body. This is the Greek worship of um, athletic um, achievement, of achievement in warfare, um, the medieval um, worship of, you know, the knight, the, that kind of achievement as well, achievement in warfare. Um, it's basically 
it's basically all that kind of thing. Um, excellence, excellence, but in a more like vital physical sense. Um, and the the key thing is that it's over and it's it's above the values of the sensual. So when it's to do with the body, it's not to do with the body in the sense of pleasing the body. Yeah. Very often what the noble will involve is discipline of the body, subjection of the body, um, pain towards the body. Um, but in a sense, it's for the body. It's for the greater kind of yes. grandeur of the body. Yeah. Um, and so that's why it is above that level. Now, the reason I said I'm really fascinated about this, apart from just the fact that it's an attempt to um, to kind of deal with both Nietzsche and Christianity is because I think that as a culture in general, we've lost sight of the vital values. Like that level as a distinct level kind of has dropped out. It's like we, and Nietzsche Shaila makes this argument that basically the enlightenment did this. It reduced everything to being mind or like pure physical matter, if you know what I, I mean, see. the intellectual yes. or the physical. And so what, what drops out is this middle level of the vital, the life force. Why does it drop out because of that? Because there's no language to sort of talk, partly because there's no language to talk about it, right? Yeah. So um, if you look at the world through that particular lens, which is, let's say, I don't know what to call it. Let's call it an enlightenment lens or a materialistic lens. Um, if you believe that the world, the physical world, nature is made out of um, matter, uh, and only that, everything is made out of matter, there's only two principles or or realms of possible things that you can accept one is matter and one is the the intellect which recognizes matter or comes to that conclusion yeah. if you know what i mean yeah right um there's nothing in between um and so that i think that's why people um kind of um lost that one one of the reasons yeah. it's also why they lost the sense of you know all the intricacies of like ethical feeling and so forth, which is another argument that Shayla makes and which is why he's kind of putting this um, model forward. The, the, re the, the very reasons of the heart that the mind knows nothing of, like that's the realm that became reduced to either the mind or the body, right? Yes. <laughs> ethics is either a matter of thinking or ethics is just a matter of like physiology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I'm seeing. I'm seeing exactly what you're saying. Actually, it's so the heart. Heart then becomes like this irrational type of, you know. Yes. Type, yeah. It gets it gets made fun of a lot because of that because it's reduced down to it. It's um, either reduced up to the mind or down to the body, yeah. um, and therefore it has no place. It doesn't fit. But in in more ancient ways of thinking about things, it would it not only had a place, but it was more the center. Yes, it's it true. Part. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, the, I think the Egyptians understood that like, as well. Like, they didn't even think so much about the brain. They didn't care so much about it. They took it out, mummification even. But the heart was mm. extremely important. Yes. Yeah. It was one of the most yeah, important yeah. bits. Yeah. And does it not collapse the spiritual values then, the enlightenment, it just the vital? Um, so how do you mean? Well, you're saying that the, the what the enlightenment does, it, it reduces things to the mind and to the body. And it partially, because of that, gets rid of the vital values. Um, mm -hmm. Does it only get rid of the vital values? Does it still uphold the spiritual and the absolute? Yeah, I think that it has it has a place for some of the spiritual values, spiritual yeah. being um, in the sense of intellectual. For instance, like this, like you could be a complete physicalist, a materialist. Um, I, I don't like beating up on materialists. So I'm not using that word like, particularly derogatorily but um but you could be a complete materialist but you have this inexplicable um sense that the value of truth is overwhelming like you know like the pursuit of truth continually finding out how the world is physical what its laws are you know like why do you have this motivation and why do you have this value and why is it important you can't explain it on physical term in physical terms yeah um and so I think that they do, I think that the modern enlightenment worldview does allow for the intellectual values, but only maybe, 
you know, probably things like the the cognition of truth would definitely yeah. be one that it allows for. Yeah. Oh no. Okay, I got you. And but want... aesthetics, ethics—that's something that's a bit more ambiguous, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. But it's still something, even though you have that enlightenment update of some sorts, it's inescapable. Especially beauty. Of course, you know? it's, yeah. Of course, of course, it's inescapable. If like you can't. I, you can't be you can't be a physicalist like you can have a physicalist worldview to a certain extent but you can't be a physicalist um like it's there is a there is a contradiction there you know what i mean like you're not you're there's no way for you to see the world or experience the world in which there's only matter because there's always going to be this thing which is your mind there's always yeah. going to be this thing which is consciousness you can't yeah. get rid of you know like oh for sure I, that's, that's one view i'm pretty absolute about i don't see any other, i don't see any way around that mm. i will say one thing about the mm. the diff i think there's a difference between the physicalism and the materialism and i'm not sure exactly i'm trying to figure out what it is but i know for Vicky, for example is a um i think he's a non-productive sorry He's a naturalist, right? He does he use that term about himself? Well, he's done this series with Greg Enrique called Transcendent mm -hmm. Naturalism, but I mm -hmm. think, and I'm, people can um, correct me if I'm wrong, that he's described himself as well as a non-reductive physicalist, and ah, he, okay. he, very, he very seriously distinguishes between physicalism and materialism. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to, yeah, okay. So physicalism encompasses matter, but also energy physical laws, space, time, structure, physical processes, information, state, and forces, among other things. So I think it does it does um, get in a yeah. bit more before we uh, equate the two. So I'm I'm talking about the reductive. Um, yes. What was it? Reductive Re materialist. Reduct yes, exactly. Yeah. Which, to be honest, there's probably not too many people that are like. No. Well, the thing is, in, in our software, yeah. we are. I am. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like I can I can say I'm not a materialist because I, I really think materialism is in Bernardo Castro's language baloney, but mm. we are still brought up in that. Mm. Like our our basically most of the content that I've consumed from a young age is materialist. And mm. so it's still deeply embedded inside of inside of me and my thinking, sadly. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get it out. Um it's it's really funny, isn't it? Like I know what you mean. Um yeah. But it's so, like, it really just is a popular, um, a popular worldview. It's not a particularly scientifically or, or philosophically rigorous one. Serious scientists don't tend to hold it. No. Um, especially in physics, I've read like most yeah. phys most physicists have some kind of strange ontology that you know. <laughs> um, so it is kind of funny that it's the dominant one. Yeah. Um, I yeah. Think, yeah. Sorry. Go no, ahead. good. I was just thinking, I was just going to think out loud about Viveki's position, because I, I have a lot of respect for Viveki's position, that sort of non-reductive non physicalism or, or what he calls naturalism. Yeah. Um, because, you know, he, he says, for instance, that we need to account for, if we're going to say that the objects that science discovers are real, the laws and the objects are real, um, we have to also account for like the human beings that do the experiments, like the ways that they see the equipment that they use, like the whole social setup, like you have to account for all of that. You can't just say like, there's no, there's no persons, there's no consciousnesses. Um, there's only quarks or leptons or whatever. Um, that doesn't make any sense. So huh. you have, to ha you have to include that level of ontology where yeah. you've got persons doing experiments, talking with each other, thinking, getting closer to truth. You just have to, if you also want to take the results of science seriously, um, and you have to somehow have both. So you, so he talks about having a leveled ontology or something like that, mm. um, um, which I think is really fascinating. Um, I'm more, I don't know whether I would put myself in his camp fully because I'm still... I, I think that Viveki, and I could be wrong about this, he might just be more agnostic, but I think that he doesn't really believe in supernatural phenomena. I think that he does believe they're explainable in naturalistic ways. Yeah. Would you would you agree with that? Or? I, I think that Viveki, and I'm not sure, again, mm. but 
I think he is a non-reductive physicalist. I just checked online. I've seen him describe mm-hmm. himself as such. Mm-hmm. But I think he might not like the supernatural slash natural distinction. I think I think it's something that that he already rejects in a sense. Yes. Do you know Although, what I mean? The question would be, does he in rejecting in rejecting the distinction? Is it because he's collapsing the supernatural into the natural, if you know what I mean? Well, here's, a, here's an example that he speaks about mm-hmm. often um, mm-hmm. in biblical stories. When in, in, in Exodus, the, mm-hmm. you know, the water gets separated, the Red Sea gets separated. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. He's like, if that's God, then that, that, would, that would make him quite weak in a sense, like... If, 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 if that's an intervention of God, that's what he can do, then he would mm-hmm. be worried, you know, like that's not a big thing to him. Um, mm-hmm. If you consider all of not just creation, but being itself. And so he's mm-hmm. a non, he's a non-theist. He thinks that mm-hmm. God is a non-being he is the ground of being. Yes. And so yeah. basically intervening within that would kind of contradict God, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. Because it's not like he's not, um, it's not like he's not intervening. He's just he's just always intervening. Exactly. It it, it would it would it would imply around. he's not yeah. a he's not a non-being. It would imply he's a being. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I think that's the position he's holding. Um, and I, yeah, I've I've heard him speak about supernatural. I even asked him the question myself because I was reading Spinoza at the time, and he's very much informed by Spinoza in terms mm-hmm. of his religious views. I think, um, especially about about God. And Spinoza's idea about God is that God is, um, he's nature, but he's also, what is this, what is this term that Spinoza always said? Um, Substance? I'll quickly check. Spinoza, nature, nature is God. He says, Deus sive natura. Let me check very quickly. And someone in the comments will definitely know. Um, cards are proper, psychological side for the relationship between God. Yeah, he's a panentheist and not a pantheist. Does not project as inappropriate the religious psychological attitudes demanded by theism. Okay, I'm not really nailing it down right now. But is uh, it substance? The, the term I've heard he uses is substance. Does that sound right? It, it no? might be. Can you can you elaborate on it? So he just argues that there's like one substance basically, and that um, all all the things that exist are just um, what's the term he uses? Attributes of that substance, I think. Yes. Um, attributes and modes of that one substance, and so that one substance can be called God, or it can be called nature. Um, they're both the same. They're both the same thing, basically. Is, uh, is that is that kind of what you were getting at? I think it's similar. I think the term that that gets used when describing Spinoza, and I think that may be for Vicky, mm. but I've I've not heard himself call this. It's, it's not pantheism, but a panentheism. And that's some some idea that the divine and the universe, so the na- nature and God, they're mm. similar, but they're not the same. Uh, right. There's an ontological yeah. distinction between them. Yeah, so there's in different sense. interpretations of Spinoza. So yeah, people people have interpreted him as just a, a pantheist, which yes. is kind of what I was presenting, which is maybe the more common one, where God is nature is an equation, like the the same. Um, and but but yeah, there is that other maybe deeper way of um, interpreting him, which is that. Um, uh, so how does he talk about it? I think he says something like matter and mind are just two attributes of God, but God has infinite attributes. Yes. Right. Yeah, exactly. So in that sense, God transcends everything we know, basically. So he's not just he's not just the physical universe. Yeah. And that would be panentheism. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I mean there, there there's some sense in which even even the Egyptians had some idea about this where they were like in the the the, the primal God was in some sense beyond creation. And he had yes. to be for them, you know. Like, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, um, it's funny that we've come to this topic because that's this was this was one thing we were thinking of talking about. Yeah, it's fascinating that so many different cultures, um, kind of come to the same idea. Um, like mm. that that is just 
maybe in the same way that there's all these impl um, in sort of implicit values or inherent values just waiting to be discovered. There's maybe this sort of these theological ideas just just there in reality waiting to be discovered because yeah the idea of the transcendent soul single deity it, it, it seems to arise in every culture yeah. um and i i listened to your video on um on amun mm -hmm. on that uh, particular papyrus um which was really really fascinating because i i know actually very little about ancient egypt i want to learn more um but it was really fascinating to hear the same kind of patterns um in that, like you have this polytheistic, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 what, what's a group of gods called? A pantheon. You have uh -huh. this polyth polytheistic pantheon. Yeah. And then um, what inevitably seems to happen is that one of the gods gets elevated to the supreme position. And mm -hmm. then that supreme position comes to look like transcendent, like, you know, yeah. like a panentheistic thing. You yeah, had exactly. a similar similar trajectory in um in india um so the the vedas very ancient texts maybe a thousand bc 2000 bc in their written form a very ancient texts um and they 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 are, well the rig veda which is the first one is a collection of hymns to the all the different gods because they also had a polytheistic system but what you sort of notice is that um the different gods are each in turn um worshipped as though they're the supreme <laughs> yeah so so in that sense it's a henotheistic thing yeah and then and then later on you get the upanishads which are sort of added to the end of each veda which are the sort of panentheistic or you know the the spiritual experiences of oneness that yeah. the that the the rishis in the forest have yeah um and so that's combined in there um, Hinduism is really fascinating because it, it seems to include all the different possibilities. Um, you've got um, polytheism, you've got the henotheism, you've got the panentheism. Later on in, in, in Indian history, you also get the development of like actual monotheisms, um, uh, you know, out of this as well. Yeah. You, it's 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 really interesting and it kind of shines a light on what may have happened in Israel, right? Where yeah. You you have a you have a pantheon of deities, um, but you have this need to kind of connect to the ultimate ground of being, but you need to do that through a particular deity. You 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 don't just start from scratch. Maybe some people do. Maybe a couple of Greek philosophers try yeah. to start from scratch. <laughs> but usually, you start to see one particular deity as being um, um, being that thing. So in India, you know some. Some see Shiva as being this deity. Some see Vishnu as being this deity. Um, there's a very popular system of Hindu theology which says there's five gods that you can take as being the absolute, and it doesn't matter which one you pick. Just pick one and just worship them as the absolute. It's totally fine. And, you know, like, that's 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 just how it is. Yeah. Um but yeah, anyway, I found that fascinating. So <laughs> yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot to to latch on to there again. I think mostly in, in Egyptian history that's that that anatheistic perspective was like as I as I mentioned in the video, it's like temporary, you know, just like what you're saying. Like you could just do it and then Yes. And then you could stop it doing it after. It wasn't necessarily a contradiction to sort of worship one God as supreme and then um worship another god as supreme um yeah. what was also fascinating is the whole Akhenaten interlude right yeah that's another example of like history repeating itself or yeah. manifesting itself in a different place he suppressed the other gods yeah so he kind of said this is the one true god and the other gods are going to get um the temples destroyed or whatever yeah um, but the same thing happened in Israel later on. Presumably there wasn't a connection between the two. Maybe there was some kind <laughs> of strange connection, but I think it probably organically arose in um, Israel, yeah. ancient Israel. Yeah. And it followed the same trajectory. If you've got the one supreme being, how can you tolerate other gods? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. especially the worship of other gods, because it's, it's, it's in some ways... Um, yeah, this idolatry that, that that you then start to conceptualize. It's like if you don't 
worship that God, then then there's something wrong. But I I, I don't struggle so much with um with there just being a hierarchy. I think that makes sense to me. But maybe mm. the you know how in the Bible we have angels. Um, mm-hmm. I think even in Mesopotamian thought, you start to see this arise with with Marduk being the highest being, and you almost get a different a different conception of of the other gods. They're not maybe gods isn't even the right translation there, and so we yeah, still you, you see it a bit in Zoroastrianism as well. But sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, no, but exactly that. It's that there there's a hierarchy to beings. Um, so mm-hmm. it's it's not an idea that it's just God and us. There's a lot in between. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I think people that have, have had their fair share of uh, spiritual or mystical experiences will affirm that that there, there's a lot in between and, and a lot of them got names. And so. I mean, yes. Yeah. Uh, but as we're kind of jumping around a bit, which is actually really fun, but um, yeah. I don't know how it is for you, but yeah, it's good. This, this kind of brings me back to the previous point we were talking about, about um, the supernatural what is the nature of these beings? Mm. Are they um, archetypal um, in the Jungian sense? Or are they, do they have some objective reality? Um, because if they have some re- objective reality, that to me is leaning into the, um, into the supernatural realm. Can they affect events on earth? Can they change things? If you pray to them, if you perform sacrifices or do some magical act in their name, can you change the course of events? Now, this is a very debatable topic. <laughs> You've got people like um, Dean Radin does a lot of these experiments. Um, Rupert Sheldrake. I don't know if you've heard of these guys. I've but... heard of Rupert. Yeah, Rupert Sheldrake. Con- controversial figure, but um, I think he's a pretty pretty decent guy. Like he uh-huh. genuinely want you know seeks the truth. He's mm. you know not just making stuff up. Um, but, you know, there's there's a lot of experiments people have done around the supernatural or psi, I guess, supernatural is a loaded term. Things like um, one fun example is, you know, having a room full of people focusing on a certain um, number while a random number generator is operating and then finding out that the number in question comes up at a statistically improbable rate, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> so yeah. there's little that suggest something's going on in the scientific realm but nothing decisive and then if you just look at history and look at people's beliefs and experiences and I would say individual experiences too I would say that maybe most people the majority of people you ask um, if you can get them to be this honest would probably say they've had some kind of unexplainable shocking thing happen um, in their lives which is could be described as supernatural. Yeah. Um, so what's going on there? <laughs> uh, you know, like, can it all be naturally described or is there actually other stuff out there? I tend to think the latter. I'm willing to be proven wrong, but I tend to think there's more going on. What do you think? Well, um, one thing that I think people often mistake is that when something is not able to be explained it doesn't mean that um it's not real or that it's not just because something doesn't fit your theory doesn't mean that it's it's not right it may might just mean that your theory is wrong and so the way i i think about a lot of these things is that what we conceptualize as natural might not encompass everything that that could happen um does that make them supernatural in a sense because they mm. transcend the theory of, of, of what is natural? But I think we might just need to update what can happen. And um, that that's one yeah. view of it, if you know what I mean. I, I, and I think that's a really good point. That would be one way to approach it would be to say, okay, maybe these things happen, but if they happen, there's a logic behind them, right? They, yeah, well, they, yes, not, a logic, but yeah. maybe it's a different logic. You know what I mean? Yes, maybe it's a different logic. Yeah, yeah. Pre- precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Are they therefore natural? Then maybe you'd just expand your definition of natural so that that yes. also included. Um, uh, so that would be one approach. Yeah. Sorry. Um. Did I cut you off? Were you going to? No, say not really. Not really. It's. Uh, I'm just thinking a bit about again the supernatural and the natural distinction, mm-hmm. because I know that some people worry about that. I think there are some some dangers to it for sure. 
Um, mm. Like to throw things into the supernatural is to to basically make them also inaccessible in a sense, or to yeah to make them into some sort of fairy tale, and it's it's in a reductive sense because actually I love fairy tales. <laughs> and myths yeah, yeah. for that matter i don't use yes. the word myth in a reductive manner and i'm also yes. try, trying to not reduce um what can be described as as supernatural events but i think often it's similar with the question of of intuition or tapping into a, a type of cognition that that sees things that the conscious mind cannot when the unconscious mm -hmm. mind picks up on things sometimes we're able to do things that we don't even know we're able to do um mm -hmm this implicit type of intelligence and mm -hmm. you know in ancient times or in modern times still you can interpret that as being a mentalist of some sorts or someone that's like has supernatural powers mm -hmm. but i think sometimes it is and i'm not producing here but it's it's something that is able to be explained by being able to tap into into patterns um to say it a bit abstractly but i think you know what i'm trying to say you're able to, to to tap into into something within reality that a lot of people are not able to tap into and i think shamans are, are similar in that you know they're mm. they're they're seeing things that we're not able to see and that doesn't mean that the invisible to us is not real i think it's just mm. that we're not geared toward understanding it um yeah i would tend to agree and then, but then the question is like, what is the nature of that which they are seeing? Um, and in what sense is it out there, um, independent of minds? And in what sense is it just in the mind? Um, so I, I think that would be, that would be the key question between like a naturalist worldview and one that, um, but but I, this is tricky because it's partly semantics, right? Because if there's a logic, like we say, if there's a logic behind supernatural phenomena, then effectively you could just say that they're natural. So let's say that um, human beings in a room all thinking the same number can influence the random number generator. Yeah. Well, if you can do that consistently, there's obviously some sort of phenomenon going on. There's some sort of law. There's some sort of thing that you can describe there's some sort of way it works in reality, right? So that would just be expanding your um, conception of what nature is, um, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this is um, a little bit off topic. I, 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 I really yeah. want to continue this though. My, I'm, I'm going to have to go. My wife's going to go to work in a bit, but uh, I think we yeah. should extend okay. the conversation. Yes. And um, yeah, I'd love to riff more on this and perhaps we can we can get another topic in there, but I'm sure we will. So, okay. but it's okay. been, it's Fantastic. been really nice to speak again. Um, so yeah, if you're willing to, to continue the conversation, I'm happy to do that. Um, and we'll, uh, yep, absolutely. we'll stay in contact. Yep. Do you mean as a second video or like, a yeah, as a second one, like thing. we can just, okay. I, I'll yeah. just upload this. I'm uploading it next week. Um, but then mm -hmm. we can just talk again and we'll do a part two. Part two okay. to it. Sounds good. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you so lovely. much for talking Thank today. You, Thank you, Thank you so much.